بسم الله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله ومن ولا وبعد. This evening, this is our sixth session, session number six, reading from Fat al Qawiyya al Mateen, في الشرع الأربعين وتتمة الخمسين للإمام النووي وابن رجب رحمهم الله. يعني the explanation of fifty hadith of the Imam al Nawawi. And Imam Ibn Rajab, rahimahullah, uh, the explanation of a Shaykh Al-Alama Abdul Muhsin Al-Abad Al-Badr, Hafizahullah, may Allah protect and preserve him. Uh, tonight in this session, we hope, bi-idhni Allah Ta'ala, to complete what remains from the second part of the hadith, yani the second level of the deen of Allah, that which is related to Al-Iman. Uh, and what remains are two points from the pillars of Iman, Two extremely very very important points that is Al Iman Bil Yawm Al Akhir and also Al Iman Bil Qadr. After that, we want to take the third level of the Deen of Allah that is Al Ihsan, which the Shaykh mentions in brief here in this uh, summary explanation. Um, however, it is of the utmost importance that we examine it carefully and understand what is Al Ihsan and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us. Tawfiq in uh, achieving that level of worship, which is the highest level of the uh, maratib of the deen of Allah. And after that, the final topic of this hadith is the sa'a, the hour of judgment, and its signs, or at least its signs. Uh, and today, bi idhnillahi ta'ala, we hope to complete this hadith. Next week, inshallah, we'll be looking at the third hadith. And uh, due to the fact that the explanation is not extremely lengthy, uh, we should complete it in one session. So whoever is memorizing hadith, inshallah, hopefully that you start memorizing the next hadith for next week before the next session. Uh, before we look at the topics for this evening, specifically, we want to take a quick review of some of the points that we discussed last week from the questionnaire study guide for lecture number five. The first question being memorize the Prophet wasallam's explanation of al-Iman in this hadith Number two, when the Prophet ﷺ was asked, "Akhbirni an al-Iman," what was his answer? Anybody? Now, Talib. Just one note for Arabic students: "An tu'mina mansub with fatha." And tu'mina billahi wa malaikatihi wa kutubihi wa liyawm al-akhir wa tu'mina bil qadri khayrihi wa sharri. The second question, the author says, Al-Iman billahi, true faith in Allah includes having Iman in his what? Naam, Iman. Oh, I'm sorry. Ah, okay. Iman billahi and yashmalu al-Iman. بوجوده إيمان in his existence that Allah does exist نعم and his rububiyya that he is the رب العالمين نعم والألوهية he is the only one that deserves to be worshipped and his names and his characteristics or qualities Anybody want to add anything to that? That's the answer. But the Sheikh also, after that, he mentioned two other points which are of importance. This is the core of the answer as he has given it. But he also mentioned what? That he, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is to be described with the characteristics of perfection that are suitable and appropriate for him and that he should be declared to be free of every type of shortcoming, defect or imperfection. So the answer here, yani the core of the answer is that Iman in Allah requires that we believe that He exists first and foremost. And then the three main areas of Tawheed, Tawheed Al-Rububiyya, Tawheed Al-Uluhiyya, and Tawheed Al-Asma wa Sifat. Uh, and these, each of these categories require lengthy discussion. The Shaykh discussed them in brief in what we talked about last week. Question number three, the Af'al. Yani the actions of Allah relate to which type of Tawheed? 
while the af'al of al-ibad, the worship is, relates to which type of tawheed? Naam, Abdul Wali. Af'al of Allah relates to tawheed al rububiyyah the actions of Allah as the creator and the provider and the one who gives life and death and so on, who controls the affairs of the universe. Naam, and the af'al... Af'al al ibad relates to tawheed al uluhiyya yani the tawheed that relates to the actions of the worshippers worshipping Allah. Yani that they have love of Allah and fear of Allah and that they seek help from Allah and depend upon Allah and, sac- and do sacrifices. The acts that the people do, yani as acts of worship for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is what is referred to by tawheed al uluhiyya Question number four, summarize the author's explanation of what we are required to believe concerning Asma of Allah and his sifat. Yani the Shaykh explained very, very briefly what Asma, Tawheed al Asma wa Sifat entails and uh, summarize what he said. Ima- no, I'm sorry. I, I really get better with you, Qasim. MashaAllah. Hopes for him one day, so I'm going to give you a Okay. Tawheed al Asma wa Sifat, naam. To affirm all of Allah's qualities and attributes. Now, without, without making any comparison to His creation. Now, without, uh, without trying to explain the how of them. Now, no distortions or denials or any rejecting what He has confirmed for Himself. Anybody want to add to that? Anything? A little bit? A couple of small points. That we affirm for Allah these names and qualities and characters that He has affirmed for Himself, and also what the Messenger of Allah sallallahu affirmed for Him. Whatever Allah has affirmed for Himself, how can we deny it? Whatever the Messenger sallallahu has affirmed for Him, how can we deny it? To affirm all of these things that Allah has affirmed for Himself and that the Messenger sallallahu has affirmed for Him. Including the names, the beautiful names of Allah, the lofty qualities and characteristics of Allah, and to affirm them in a way that is appropriate and suitable to the perfection, the greatness, and the majesty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, without making any distortions or false interpretations, denials, and so on, as the as uh, Qasim mentioned. Now, question number four memorize the Dalil in the 42nd Surah, 11th ayat, which points to the principle of affirmation and negation as it relates to. His asma and sifat. The ayat. Naam. Fadl. Abdul Wal. Laysa kamit lihi shayin wa huwa sami'u rashid. Basir. Naam. Jazakallah khair. This question is a memorization question. And sometimes we have memorization questions. And the reason for that is because there are some ayat from the Qur'an and some hadith bare minimum that a Muslim must know. And we should memorize the Qur'an and we should memorize the Sunnah as much as possible. But if a person didn't memorize the whole of the Qur'an, there are some ayats that are of basic foundation principles that are critical. And it's better that it be memorized. And we have the ability to memorize if we just push ourselves a little. لَيْسَ كَمِثْلِهِ شَيْءٌ وَهُوَ السَّمِيعُ الْبَصِيرُ The Shaykh said in this ayat Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has gathered together the affirmation and the negation that we discussed just in the previous question, uh, the affirmation of the names or characteristics of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala came in the saying of Allah, wa huwa samil basir, and the negation came in, laysa kamithli shayun, yani that negating that there's anything or anyone that is like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in these, yani beautiful names and perfect qualities and characteristics. Question number six mentioned three points required for proper iman in the malaika, that is, their dis- from their descriptions or their responsibilities or their names. From their descriptions, the Sheikh mentioned several things from amongst them. The malaika, na? that they're created from light. Also, that Jibril is described as having 600 wings. Na? And if the angels have wings, two or three or four, Jibril is described as having 600 wings. Na? They don't disobey Allah. They do whatever they are commanded to do. And no one, that there are many, 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 yani, 
No one knows their number except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now. Now, yani a, an example of that is that the Prophet ﷺ mentions that 70,000 angels visit Al-Bayt Al-Ma'mur above the seven heavens every day. And they never return. Yani the next day, different angels came. And this is an example of the yani large number that is known only to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the number of the angels. Uh, also from there... Uh, responsibilities. What did he mention concerning the responsibilities? I'm going to start on this side because I'll never look over here. Now, yeah. Revelation. Revelation. The, to bring the revelation. Now, right. rain, death, death. Paradise. control. The womb, now, the womb, the, womb. the womb. What is in the wombs, and so on. And from their names that the Sheikh mentioned, he said in the Quran and in the Sunnah, some of their names are mentioned specifically. Uh, it's, it's huh? Israfil. Munkar. Nakia, huh? Malik, Jibril. <laughs> First and foremost, Jibril. Mikael, now. Uh, question number seven. Mention three points required for proper iman in the kutub, the revelations of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Three points that the Shaykh mentioned. That they are the speech of Allah, they are not created. It's required for us to believe that they are the speech of Allah, they are not created. Now, that they are revealed. Now. The truthfulness of every book that Allah revealed to every messenger that he sent with a revelation. Naam. Allah is the source of success. That the book, the guidance, the revelation that Allah revealed through a prophet is the source of success for the people that it was revealed to. Naam. And some of them have been named as well. Naam. Some of them have been named, some of them have not been named from amongst those that are named. Oh, that was, that's the next question, I'm sorry. List, that's question number eight. List the names of those revelations, the kutub of Allah, which are mentioned in the Quran. Somebody said Injil, Torah, Suhufi Ibrahim wa Musa. Did we miss one? Az Zabur, naam. Quran. And Quran, naam. Uh, Tayyib. Question number nine. Last question. Mention three points required for proper iman. In the messengers, the rusul, from the commentary of the author. Three points that he mentioned concerning what is required to have proper iman in the messengers. One point. Now, okay. Yani <laughs> that they were sent to guide the people to the truth, to, to give the people right guidance, to remove them out of darkness into the light. Now. Naam, that Allah has chosen, Allah Himself has chosen from amongst the human beings and He messengers that He sent to the people to guide them. Naam, what else? And that the, the Shaykh also mentioned that there are no messengers from amongst the jinn, but rather from amongst them are warners. Naam, and one final point, we'll stop with this. Uh, from amongst them, there are those that are mentioned in the Qur'an and others that are not mentioned. And those that are mentioned in the Qur'an, the Shaykh said, are? 25. 25. 20. 18 in Surah Al-Anham. 18 in and 7 elsewhere. Now, Thakallah khair. Okay, today, bi ta'ala, um, we want to complete what remained from uh, Al-Iman, uh, what, what, what the, sh- what the, the, the Prophet وسلم, has, how he has described Al-Iman, uh, the six arkan of Iman. Uh, and what remains is Al-Iman bil yawmul akhir and Al-Iman bil qadr. So we're going to do that and then as we mentioned, inshallah, we'll go to the last level of what the Prophet وسلم, mentions in this hadith concerning the levels of the deen of Allah, that is Al-Ihsan and the signs of the hour. So, on page 24 of the Arabic text of the copy that we are reading from, on the bottom of the page, and he connected to the explanation of the Prophet ﷺ's explanation of what is Iman, uh, the Shaykh mentions, وَالْإِمَانْ بِالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ وَالْإِمَانْ بِالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ يعني, to have Iman in the last day. 
What is required, he said, is a tasdiq wal iqrar bi kulli ma ja'a fi al kitab wa al sunnah an kulli ma yakunu ba'd al mawt. Kulli ma yakunu ba'd al mawt. Yani that it is that we affirm the truthfulness of and we affirm and confirm everything that came in the Quran and in the Sunnah as it relates to everything that is going to occur after death. So, Al-Iman, Bil-Yawm Al-Akhir, it includes affirming the truthfulness of whatever information came to us in the Quran and the Sunnah related to the events after death. Yani when, from the time a person dies, whatever we know from the Quran and Sunnah is going to happen, all of that is part of Al-Iman, Al-Yawm Al-Akhir. So, the Iman and Yawm Al-Akhir, it doesn't begin after the resurrection when people enter the paradise and the hellfire. Rather, it begins from the death of the person. When a person dies, all the events after that are included as Al-Iman, the Yawm Al-Akhir. Then the Shaykh says that Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala has made two places of abode. Two of them. One of them is Dar al-Dunya, yani the life in this world, and the other one is Dar al-Akhira, the next life, yani the life in the hereafter. Two places the human beings will live. There's life in this world, in a dunya and there's life in Dar al-Akhira, in the next world. The boundary, the clear line of demarcation between these two abodes is al-mawt wa-nafkhu fi sur Al-mawt is the line that separates the life in this world, in the dunya, from the life in the akhirah. When a person dies, that is where the life in this world ends. The other line or boundary that separates the life in this world from the life in the next life is a nafkh fi sur alladhi yahsulu bihi mawtu man kana hayyan fi akhir dunya yani the other sign is the blowing into the horn which will cause to occur the death of everyone who is still living at the end of this world yani anybody that is in this world when that horn is blown it will be the it will cause the occurrence of the death of everyone that is living and this is also the demarcation line, the, sign, the boundary line, the end of the life of this world. When that happens, that's the end of the life in this world for all human beings. As opposed to the end of life in this world for each human being is at their death. But this is the end, the final end, when every living being in this world, and he will be caused to die. Then the Shaykh says, وَكُلُّ مَنْ مَاتَ قَامَتْ كِيَامَتُهُ yani Every person who dies at that point of his death, his qiyamah begins. Yani, the things that's related to the next life begins at the time of his death. وَانْتَقَلَ مِنْ دَارَ الْعَمَلْ إِلَى دَارَ الْجَزَاء The shaykh here is explaining, yani, he's describing these two abodes. Yani, دَارَ الدُّنْيَا وَالدَّارَ الْآخِرَةِ He is explaining, he's describing each of them with a different description. These are their titles, دَارَ الدُّنْيَا, the abode of this world, al-akhira, the abode of the next life, he describes them as the place of work or action and the place of reward or compensation. And he, so when the person dies in taqala, he goes from dar al-amal, that is dar al-dunya, to dar al-jaza, that is dar al-akhira. When a person dies, he leaves the abode of work, where a person can do work, can do deeds, can pray can fast, can read the Qur'an, can study the deen, give da'wah, advise, uh, enjoy the good and forbid the wrong. A person can do work. But when a person dies, that's the end of that, except as the Prophet ﷺ mentioned, that there are some deeds that are ongoing. And even when a person dies, like Sadaqa Jariya, a charity that is ongoing, a knowledge that a person left behind, or a righteous child that prays for their parent. A righteous child. Not any child. Because maybe... A child that's unrighteous may pray for their parents. But the benefit here is from the righteous child. And that means that it's in our interest, if we have children, to try hard, to work, to struggle, to strive, to ask Allah's help in raising our children. So that they will be righteous children. So that even after we die, there will be some help for us in the dua of our righteous children. 
Then the Shaykh he says, Well, Hayat Bad al Maut, Hayatan, Hayatan. Yani, the life after death is two lives. There's two types of life after death. The first of them, he said, is Hayatun Barzakhiyah. Hayat Barzakhiyah. Yani, the life in the Barzakh. And he explains what that means. That life is what? Hiya ma bain al maut wal ba'ath. It is the life that a person is going to live after death and before the resurrection. There is a period of time that a person in the grave, or even if they're not in the grave, if they were drowned or burned or whatever, and in that period of time after a person dies, that's known as barzakh. And that people will live, that there is a type of life that only Allah knows, as the Sheikh says, but that is a life that's after death, but before the Resurrection to life again, Barzakh. Um, here, ma bain al maut wal ba'ath. Wal hayat ba'ad al maut, I think that it should have been wal hayat ba'ad al ba'ath. Yani the second life, the first life is hayat barzakhia. That is between death and the resurrection. And hayat ba'ad al ba'ath. Yani the life that's after the resurrection. So there's two. Types of life after death, one of them is immediately after death up until resurrection and the other one is after the resurrection. Wallahu a'lam. It seems as though from the context that is what is intended here. Then the Shaykh says, the Hayat Barzakhiya, no one knows its reality except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yani it is real life, but no human being, no one knows exactly the reality, the haqiqah of that life. What is it? How is it? And the only thing we know about it is what we have been informed of by revelation. Other than that, no human being knows yani, the reality of that life. But it is life. It is real life. And it's life after death up until the, t- the period of the resurrection. And he said this life is connected to the life after death. Yani, in other words, the life after death is two periods. The barzakh period and then after the resurrection period. So this is connected to life after after death. This type of life is connected to life after death. Uh, and perhaps you know, what is intended here is the same thing, that is connected to the life that we know after death, that is after the resurrection. I and mean, this is connected to that. And this is because in each one of them, the life in the barzakh and the life after the resurrection, each one of them, fi kullin minhuma al jaza'u al al-amal. In each one of them there is reward. For a person's deeds. There's compensation for a person's deed. Good for good and the opposite as well. So they are related in which way? That there's jaza in the barzakh and there's also jaza in the life that is after the resurrection. The Shaykh says, what type of yani, uh, jaza? The ahlu as saada muna'amuna fil kubur bi na'im al jannah. وَأَهْلُ الشَّقَاوَةِ مُعَذَّبُونَ فِيهَا بِعَذَابِ النَّارِ يعني the jaza for the Ahlu Sa'ada, the people who will be fortunate, the people who will enjoy happiness because of the reward of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Those people, they will be experiencing bliss in the grave due to the na'im of the Jannah. While they're in the grave, before they enter the Jannah, they will be experiencing some of the bliss, some of the joy, some of the happiness of Jannah, even while they are in the grave. While the people of Shaqawa, the unfortunate, the wretched people, the people yani, who Allah will punish, then they will be experiencing punishment from the punishment of the fire while they are in the grave. So there is yani, Naim al Jannah, and there is also Adab and Nar in the grave. People will experience the bliss of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala while they're in the grave, or the punishment, and if that's what they are deserving of. Finally, the Sheikh says, and obviously this is a tremendous summary, but the Sheikh, he, he puts here in the closing of the point of believing in the Yawm Al-Akhir, he gives us a summary of the affairs that we should be thinking about when he said earlier that Al-Iman bil Yawm Al-Akhir includes everything after death. So there are lots of things that that includes, and here the Sheikh Hafidhullah mentions a summary of those things, summary of them. He says, وَيَدْخُلْ فِي الْإِيمَانِ بِالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ الْإِيمَانِ بِالْبَعْثِ وَالْحَشْرِ 
والشفاعة والحود والحساب والميزان والصراط والجنة والنار وغير ذلك مما جاء في الكتاب والسنة. So here the Sheikh is summarizing. يعني what he alluded to in the beginning of this point and that is that all of the affairs that occur after death are included in Al-Iman بليوم الآخر. And from amongst the major events that we should be thinking about when we think about Al-Iman بليوم الآخر is يعني having Iman in Al-Ba'ath, the resurrection, that dead people will be resurrected. Al-Hashr, that the people will be gathered. Al-Shafa'ah, that there will be intercession by the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to whomever he allows, for whomever he allows. There's the Hawd and the Hisab and the Mizan. So there's the pawn that the uh, people will drink from. Yani, and the Prophet sallallahu said, describe to us that pawn. What will be some of his characteristics? Yani, from his characteristics is that a person who drinks from it will never experience thirst again. Then he said, Al-Hisab, that is the accounting that every person will be called to account for what we have, yani what we're responsible for in this world. The hisab is the thing from amongst these things that he has mentioned that a person has to be very concerned about in this world because it is now what you do that will make the difference in the time of hisab. A person's account will be just and fair and it will only be according to what we have done. Al-Mizan is the weighing of the deeds. Weighing of the deeds. And as-sirat is the bridge that people will cross over to enter into paradise. Or they may fall off into the punishment. And the nar is the destination of the people who disbelieve and the people who are disobedient. Even from amongst the believers. If, they, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't forgive their sins, then they be punished, may be punished for some time. The actual people whose Yani, place is the nar, or the people who will be there permanently, the people who have disbelieved. And all of this, he said, is part of what we are talking about when we say al-Iman, bil-yawm al-akhirah, in addition to other than that, other things that came in the Qur'an and in the authentic sunnah. So this is a big topic, and volumes of books have been written about it, and it is incumbent upon each of us to go back and read further on this topic that the Shaykh, may Allah protect and preserve him, has summarized here. The final point of Al-Iman, the pillars of Iman, the Shaykh says, Al-Iman bil-Qadr. Yani having Iman in the divine decree. And this includes, Yani Al-Iman bi-anna Allah qadra kull ma huwa ka'inun ila yawm al-qiyamah. Yani the summary of Iman bil-Qadr is that it is to believe in everything that Allah has predetermined, that He has measured out for the creation, everything related to our lives, that He predetermined. Everything that's going to happen until Yawm Al-Qiyamah. And it has four levels, the Shaykh says, and he summarized them. Ilm, Kitabah, Mashiach, and Khalq. That, that it includes Allah's knowledge eternally. Yani from the, he always had knowledge of everything that is going to occur. This is part of Al-Iman bil Qadr, that we believe that Allah always had knowledge of everything that will occur. Second thing that he wrote, these things that are pre-decreed before he created the heavens and the earth, 50,000 years before he created the heavens and the earth. And the third level is Mashiach, that Allah's Mashiach, his will, yani it is by his will that everything that he decrees occurs. And finally he said, Khalqullah wa ijaduhu li kulli ma qaddarahu tibqan lima alimahu wa katabahu wa sha'ahu. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who creates everything brings into existence everything that he has pre-decreed in accordance with his knowledge and in accordance with what he had written and in accordance with his will. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the only creator. There's not a creator of good and a creator of evil. There's only one creator that is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and everything that exists and our actions and our qualities and our characteristics, all of it is the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and it is in accordance with Allah's eternal knowledge. It is in accordance with what Allah had written before he created the heavens and the earth by 50,000 years and it's in accordance with the will of Allah. Then the Shaykh says, and he closed this point and he also very extremely summarized. He says, so it is obligatory for us to have Iman in these four aspects of the Qadr, these four levels of the Qadr and to believe that everything 
which Allah wills. اعتقاد أن كل شيء شاعه الله يعني everything that Allah willed it must occur it must come into existence and that everything which Allah didn't will it is not possible for it to exist to occur and this is the meaning of the saying of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم وعلم أن ما أصابك لم يكن ليخطيك وما أخطأك لم يكن ليصيبك يعني that no, the Prophet ﷺ said, no, that whatever has befallen you, it could not have passed you by. And whatever had passed you by, it could not have befallen you. Yani everything is by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whatever he has willed will be and whatever he didn't will will never occur. And then the Shaykh says, and this hadith, this statement here will come yani in hadith number 19 of the 40 hadith of Al-Imam al after this, the final level of the levels of the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, the saying in this hadith, فَأَخْبِرْنِي عَنَ الْإِحْسَانِ yani The saying of Jibreel alayhi salam, he said, so inform me about al-ihsan. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa answered by saying, أَن تَعْبُدَ اللَّهِ كَأَنَّكَ تَرَاهُ فَإِن لَمْ تَكُنْ تَرَاهُ فَإِنَّهُ يَرَاكَ this is the definition of the Prophet Sallallahu of Ihsan and before we look at it very very briefly, the Shaykh doesn't discuss it in any length here, but before we look at it very very very, very briefly, I want to remind us of the importance of these few words in which he has described Al-Ihsan, which is the highest level of the maratib of the deen of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. So if Islam is important to us, and obviously it is, that's why we have entered into Islam, or maybe we are from families that, and we were already Muslim, if Iman, if we know that it is important, then how much more so Al-Ihsan? So it is important for us to reflect on what, how the Prophet ﷺ has described it here, so that we can look at ourselves and see what means do we have, what method, what way do we have to achieve this level, yani from the maratib of the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Al-Ihsan. He said, it is that you worship Allah as though you are seeing Him. فَإِن لَمْ تَكُنْ تَرَهُ and if it is that you didn't see him, you couldn't achieve that level. You need to worship Allah as though you are seeing him. If you didn't reach that level, فَإِنَّهُ يَرَاكَ Then know indeed that he sees you. And you worship Allah as though you are seeing him. If not, then at least know for sure. Be conscious, be aware, call to your mind that Allah indeed sees you. So these are two levels of Ihsan, the first of them being higher than the second. The Shaykh says, Al-Ihsan ala darajat. Yani the Ihsan is the highest of the levels, yani the highest level in the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And below it is Darajat al-Iman. Yani below Darajat al-Ihsan is Darajat al-Iman, is less than Ihsan. And below that is the level of, or the degree of al-Islam, lower than the two of them. Then the Shaykh says, Wa kullu mu'min Muslim. Every mu'min, every person who has reached the level of Iman, then they are also included in yani, the description of Muslim. They are also Muslim because Iman is a higher level. It includes it. And every Muhsin is also a Mu'min and Muslim because it is a higher level and it includes Iman and Islam. While not every Muslim is a Mu'min and a Muhsin. Yani in this, from this perspective of what is Iman and Ihsan doesn't mean that a person is not a believer if he didn't reach the level of Iman here in the meaning of this hadith doesn't mean that person is not a believer but they haven't reached the level where they have the right to be described with this yani, characteristic of Iman and, and for this reason yani, the levels of Islam and Iman yani, one being higher than the other other for this reason it came in Surah Al-Hujurat the saying of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala قالت الأعراب آمنا yani, the Bedouins they said we have believed and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala responded to them saying, Kullam tu'minu, walakin kulu aslamna. Yani, say that you have not believed, but rather say that you have surrendered. Yani, in Islam. Yani, you have accepted the Islam. You have agreed to submit and surrender, but you haven't reached that level, the higher level of Iman that's mentioned in this particular hadith. وَلَمَّا يَدْخُلْ إِيمَانَ فِي قُلُوبِكَ and uh, yani Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, not yet, lamma yadkhul. Yani, not yet. Lamma here, it, the, the connotation is that indeed, Iman has not yet entered into your hearts. But there's a further meaning, and that is, not yet. 
That means that there's hope that a person can reach that level of iman. So here in this ayat, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shows the distinction between the level of Islam and the higher level iman. And then as far as Ihsan the Shaykh says, and it came in this hadith, the clarification of the high level, the lofty station of the level of Ihsan. And that is in the saying of the Prophet وسلم, and ta'bud Allah ka'annaka tarahu. That is that you worship Allah as though you are seeing him. How does the Shaykh explain this in just a few words? Some of the scholars have written in length about the meaning of these words. The Shaykh summarized it in a very simple and easy way to understand. He said to worship Allah as though you're seeing him, it means ta'abudahu ka'annaka waqifun bayna yadehi tarahu. Yani worship him as though you are standing in front of him, standing in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, seeing him. If a person can think about how it would be, if your heart reached that level and your consciousness, your iman reached the level that you worship Allah as though you are standing in front of him, seeing him. This is something yani, to strive for and tawfiq is only from Allah. وَمَنْ كَانَ كَذَلِكَ فَإِنَّهُ يَأْتِي بِالْعِبَادَةِ عَلَى التَّمَامِ وَالْكَمَالِ The Shaykh says, so whoever was like that, that was their condition, that they were able to worship Allah as though they are standing in front of Him, looking at Him, then that person will perform their worship perfectly and completely. That person will perform their worship perfectly and completely. وَإِن لَمْ يَكُنْ عَلَى هَذِي الْحَالِ but if a person wasn't on that level, didn't reach that level of consciousness to worship Allah like that, فَعَلَيْهِ أَنْ يَسْتَشْعِرْ أَنَّ اللَّهَ مُطَّلِعٌ عَلَيْهِ لَا يَخْفَ مِنْهُ خَافِيَةٌ Then in that case, the person should strive for the next level of ihsan, which is also excellent, no doubt. It is incumbent, he said, then the person have to bring to their mind the consciousness. They must be aware that Allah is overlooking you and that there is nothing concealed that is hidden from him. If something is concealed, it's not hidden from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So these are the two levels yani, that the Prophet sallallahu mentions concerning al-ihsan in this hadith. And the first of them is that a person try to reach a level of iman. Yani due to their reflection on the Qur'an due to their knowledge of the names and sifat of Allah, due to their reflection on the creation of Allah and their remembrance of Allah constantly, a person's heart will be in a condition that they will be nearer to Allah and perhaps reach that level of worshiping Allah as though they are standing in front of Him, seeing Him. If a person couldn't reach that, then at least be conscious, be aware, constantly call to, a, call to mind that Allah is watching over us and that there is nothing, even that which is concealed, to the creation, nothing is hidden from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He said, in this case, yani the second level, the person is conscious that Allah is watching them. He said, the person would take every precaution that Allah would not see him in a position, in a situation or circumstance that he has prohibited. Yani that Allah will not see that person doing something that he has prohibited or being somewhere that he has prohibited. Rather, that person will act upon, yani, do things that, such that, so that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would only see them doing that which he has commanded. If a person is aware that Allah is watching them, then they will be cautious and careful to avoid doing anything from that which Allah has prohibited, and rather they would try to engage themselves and busy themselves in doing the things that Allah has commanded. After this, the Shaykh mentions the last part of the hadith related to the hour. He said the saying, so inform me about the hour, yani the hour of judgment. He said, yani The Prophet وسلم, said, the one who is being questioned about the hour is not more knowledgeable than the one who is asking the question. Yani every created being is equal in reference to this matter of the knowledge of the hour. Every, the questioner and the one who is being questioned are equal. And in that sense, as the Shaykh mentions, every created being is equal, that no one knows about this except Allah. He says, Allah bi ilm that this is the knowledge of the hour is something that is exclusive to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. No one knows when the hour will be established except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned in Surah Al-Luqman, 31st Surah, 34th, 
fourth ayah, إِنَّ اللَّهَ عِنْدُهُ عِلْمُ السَّاعَةِ That indeed Allah with him is the knowledge of, of the hour, meaning that he is the only one who knows the hour. وَيُنَزِّلُ الْغَيْثِ And he is the one who sends down the rain. وَيَعْلَمُ مَا فِي الْأَرْحَامِ And he is the only one who knows completely, perfectly, the knowledge of what is in the wombs. Not just is it male or female, but everything about it. Yani, it's life in this world, if it's going to be, if it's going to live, and what it's going to do in its end, its destination in the paradise. So that Allah is the only one who knows, yani, about that which is in the womb. And no soul knows what it will earn tomorrow. Yani, we don't know about tomorrow. And no soul knows in which land it will die. In Allah, Alim al Indeed, Allah. He is the one who has knowledge of everything and he is all aware of everything. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also says in another place in Surah Al-An'am, 6th Surah 59th Ayat, وَإِنْدَهُ مَفَاتِهُ الْغَيْبِ لَا يَأَلَمُهَا إِلَّا هُوَ That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with him and with him alone are the keys of the unseen and no one knows them except him. And from amongst the مَفَاتِهُ الْغَيْبِ is the ilm as-sa'a, yani the knowledge of the hour, as, men- as mentioned in the hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari from Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anhuma, that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, مفاتي الغيب خمسة يعني the keys of the unseen, they are five, and then he recited this ayat beginning with إِنَّ Allah إِنْدُهُ عِلْمَ السَّعَى that indeed with Allah is the knowledge of the hour. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also said in Surah Al-A'raf, 7th Surah, 187th ayat, يَسْأَلُونَكَ عَنِ السَّعَى أَيَّانَ مُرْسَاهَا قُلْ إِنَّمَا عِلْمُهَا to the end of the ayat, that they are asking about the hour. When will be its appointed time? Say, yani the Prophet ﷺ is being ordered to say that the knowledge of this is with my Rabb. No one will know its time except Allah to, as we said, to the end of the ayat. After this, the Shaykh goes on to complete this particular point by saying, yani, while no one knows the time of the, yani the hour of judgment, he said it, it did come in the sunnah that the hour of judgment will be on Yawmul Jumu'ah. And the hour of judgment, it came authentically reported in the sunnah that it will be on Yawmul Jumu'ah as far as in which year, unknown. As far as in which month of the year, no one knows except Allah. As far as which Jumu'ah from any particular month, yani all of this is unknown. No one knows that except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then he mentions the hadith reported by Al-Imam Abu Dawood rahimahullah on the authority of Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu. He said the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, خَيْرُ يَوْمٍ طَلَعَتْ فِيهِ الشَّمْسُ يَوْمُ الْجُمْعَةِ And that the best day in which the sun rose is on يَوْمُ الْجُمْعَةِ فِيهِ خُلِقَ آدَمْ In that day, يَوْمُ الْجُمْعَةِ Adam was created وَفِيهِ أُحْبِطَ And in that day, he was removed from the paradise and in that day, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala يعني, granted him success to turn in repentance and accepted his repentance. مات, and in that day on Yom Juma, يعني, he died. And in that day will be the establishment of the hour of judgment. And then the Prophet وسلم, said uh, in this lengthy hadith, the, the Shaykh he mentions this extra part of it. وَمَا مِن دَابَةٍ إِلَّا وَهِيَ مُسِيخَةٌ يَوْمُ الْجُمْعَةِ مِنْ حِينَ تُصْبِحُ حَتَّى تَطْلَعُ الشَّمْسِ شَفَقًا مِنَ السَّاعَةِ إِلَّا الْجِنْ وَالْإِنْسِ And then this is what he stopped in this narration of this hadith. He said that, that there is no yani, animal except that it will be in waiting for the hour of judgment on يَوْمُ الْجُمْعَةِ from the time of subh, yani from the time of the breaking of the dawn until the rising of the sun. That period in the morning, from the time of the breaking of dawn until the rising of the sun, every animal will be yani, in fear of the hour, except the jinn and human beings. Yani, that every creature will know that the hour of judgment is going to be on Yom Juma at that time, in that period of time, between the dawn and the sunrise. So on Yom Jumu'ah, in that period of time, every animal will be in fear, except the human beings and the jinn. In this hadith, the Shaykh says, Hadithun Sahihun, Rijaluhu Rijal Kutub Sitta, Ilal Ka'nabi, Falam Yukhrij Lahu Ibn Majah. Yani, technical point that the Shaykh is saying here, this is authentic hadith. The narrators of the hadith are the narrators that 
hadith are reported on their authority in all of the books of Sitta, except one narrator, al Kanabi, rahimahullah, who what, there's no hadith reported with him in the Isnad by Ibn Majah. All the other narrators are reported, are in chains of narration in all the books, the Sitta, except Kanabi, he's not mentioned in any narration or any Isnad of Ibn Majah. Then the Shaykh closes this point by saying, the meaning of the statement, مَلْ مَسْؤُولْ عَنْهَا بِأَعْلَمْ مِنَ السَّعِلْ The one who is being questioned about it is not more knowledgeable than the questioner. The meaning of this is that the creation, yani everything in the creation, no one or nothing in the creation knows when the hour of judgment will be established. وَأَنَّ أَيِّ سَعِلْ وَأَيِّ مَسْؤُولْ سَوَى فِي عَدْمِ الْعِلْمِ بِهَا yani that no matter what, who is the questioner or who is the one, Asking or uh, being asked the question, everyone is equal in this matter. That is, in that no one knows, no one has knowledge of this particular matter, the knowledge of the hour. Uh, after this, the Shaykh uh, mentions the last point, the last main point from this hadith, uh, the saying of Jibril, where he said, فَأَخْبِرُنِي an amaratiha. Yani, if no one knows about the hour when it will be, well, what are its signs? The Shaykh said, I mean, in the hadith, the Prophet said, An talida al amatu rabbataha, wa an tara al hufat al urat al alata, riya al shai yatatawaluna fil bunyan. Yani, from the signs of the hour of judgment, is that a slave girl will give birth to her master, mistress. And that um, you will see the impoverished, the, yani, uh, barefooted, um, naked, yani not having clothing, um, shepherds competing in building tall buildings. The Sheikh says, yani, the meaning of amaratuha, it means alamatuha. Yani, it's signs, the signs of the hour. Yani, uh, he said they are divided into two divisions, the signs which are near and the signs which are before that. Yani the signs which are near to the actual establishment of the hour, the major signs of the hour of judgment, and the second division is the signs that are before that. So the lesser signs that are before that. He says from the signs of the nearness of the establishment of the hour is the, um, the sun coming forth from the place of its setting. The sun coming forth from the place where it sets. And the coming of the Dajjal, Masih Dajjal. And he says also, the coming forth of Yajuj and Ma'juj, Gog and Magog, and the descending of Isa ibn Maryam, alayhi salatu wasalam, from the heavens, and other than that. From, these are from the major signs. And each one of these signs and it require us to go back and look at least and see yani, some of the details concerning. The Shaykh is just mentioning them in passing as a means of indicating that this is something that we also need to know in reference to yani, the hour of judgment. What are its signs? The major signs and the lesser signs uh, and we should go back and look at them. Yani, for a brief discussion of this topic, if somebody wants to read something brief, then Al-Imam Muhammad ibn Salih Uthaymeen has a beautiful summary of these uh, major signs of the last day in his explanation of Lumat al-Itiqad by Al-Imam ibn Qudama rahimahullah. The Shaykh says, uh, so these are the, these are, what he mentioned here are from the signs of the nearness of the hour, the major signs, and then he said the other signs are those that come before that. And from the signs that are, are from the lesser signs from before that are the two things that are mentioned in this hadith. Yani, that the slave girl would give birth to her mistress, and that the, yani, barefooted, naked, um, Bedouins would um, and he compete in building tall buildings. The Sheikh says the meaning of this statement from the signs of the hour and tell the ummatahu rabbataha al amatu rabbataha, yani that a slave girl would give birth to its mistress. He said this has been explained in two ways, or yani from the explanations of it is number one. It has been explained that this is an indication of. Yani the multitude of 
um, conquests that would take place and the multitude of the captives, the pr prisoners of war. And from amongst those female prisoners of war captives uh, are those who her master would have relations with her and she would give birth yani, to a child for him. So she became Um Walad, yani, the mother of the child, meaning the slave who gives birth to a child for her master. Uh, so he said this is one explanation so that that child from the slave woman, that child would be in the position of being the master yani, of the one who gave birth to him. Another explanation he said is that it has been explained as, as an indication of the changing of conditions that would take place in the world uh, and the occurrence of disobedience of children being extremely disobedient to their mothers and their fathers and that those children would have control over their parents such that it would be as though the children are the masters of their mothers and their fathers. Disobedience of children to their parents to such an extent it is as though they are the masters of their parents. The Shaykh, um, he says at the end of this discussion um, that these two signs mentioned here have already occurred and the second of them any disobedience of children to their parents uh, is witnessed today by any everyone may Allah save us from having children that reflect this sign of the last day may Allah make our children righteous children yani, so that they can supplicate for us after our death and obedient children yani, so that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will reward them as well uh, the saying of the, the meaning of the saying of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi tara al hufat al urat al ala riasha yatatawalun fil bunyan. Poor, naked, barefooted shepherds competing in building tall buildings. He said it means al fuqara. الَّذِينَ يَرَعَوْنَ الْغَنَمْ وَلَا يَجِدُونَ مَا يَكْتَسُونَ بِهِ يعني the poor people who are um, uh, grazing animals and they didn't even find anything to clothe themselves with. Their conditions would change and then they would go to the city dwelling places and they would be competing in building tall buildings. He said both of these signs have already occurred. The last point that the Sheikh mentions is in the end of the hadith, in the narration as the Shaykh mentions it, فَمَّنْ طَلَقَ فَلَبِثَ مَلِيًّا And in some of the narrations, yani in some of the transcripts it has, فَمَّنْ طَلَقَ فَلَبِثْتُ مَلِيًّا ثُمَّ قَالَ يَا عُمَرْ أَتَدْرِي مَنَ السَّعِلْ قُلْتُ وَاللَّهُ وَرَسُولُهُ أَعْلَمْ قَالَ فَإِنَّهُ جِبْرِيلُ أَتَاكُمْ يُعَلِّمُكُمْ دِينَكُمْ Yani then he went away, that is Jibreel alayhi salam, and in this narration he waited for some time, in the other narration, I waited for some time and then the Prophet ﷺ said to me, O oh Umar, do you know who the questioner was? And I said, Allah and his messenger knows best. He said, indeed, it is Jibril. He came to teach you your deen. Uh, and the Shaykh says, the meaning of Maliyan, it means zamanan, yani some time passed. Uh, and the, and the, um, the Prophet ﷺ had informed his companions about the questioner, that it was Jibreel alayhi salam, <coughs> after his departure from them. Uh, and it is reported in some of the narrations that he informed Umar after three. And there's no contradiction between this. That is because the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam informed those who were present and Umar had no longer been amongst them. Yani he had departed himself. Uh, he had departed from the gathering at, from that point yani before the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam informed them about who was the questioner. And then it happened um, that the Prophet, that Umar radiallahu anhu met the Prophet sallallahu after three, and he was informed that it was Jibril. The last thing that we have here, as we mentioned, the minhaj of the Shaykh in his explanation of these hadith, is that he would can he explain each hadith in points, point by point paragraphs, and he's separating one point from another. And then in the end, the last point would be some of the benefits that are derived from the hadith. And here the Shaykh mentions 12 of them. 
and there are some other points that we wanted to add, but because any of the shortness of time and the nearness of the ikama will just suffice with what he has mentioned here, and maybe at another time try to go back um, with some further details. So from that which is derived from this hadith number one, and inshallah we're going to try to send to the class um, yani the translation of these points since the book is not translated, at least these points we'll try to share with you from our brother Abdul Salam uh, who has translated this, uh, these um, fawaid previously. The first point he said is that um, the questioner, a questioner, uh, just as they ask a question in order to learn, they might also ask a question in order to teach. That is, they might ask somebody who they know has knowledge of a particular affair for the purpose of those who are present to hear the answer and to learn from it. As Jibreel alayhi salam, knew the answer to the questions that were answered, but he asked yani, the question in order for the people to benefit. Second point, that the angels are able to change the form of their creation by the permission of Allah, and they may come in the form of human beings. And this, the changing of the form of the angels, is not a proof or a delil for the permissibility of acting and plays and movies and this type of thing, which has become widespread in this day and time. This is not a delil for that, because this, yani these plays and acting, is a form of kedhib. Yani it's false. It's not true. But what happened with the angel Jibreel, alayhi salam, this was by the permission of Allah and by the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So there's no relation between the two. Number three, he said, clarification of the adab of the muta'allim and al-mu'allim. Yani, in this hadith, there is some clarification of the manners of the student in the presence of the teacher. And the shaykh doesn't go into any details here, but yani, perhaps some of the details that we might look at in the future yani, relate to the manner of the student coming to the gathering for learning, their dress, their behavior, their calmness, their respect, um, sitting near to the teacher, uh, and so on like this, how to ask questions and so on. And Sheikh Salih Fawzan, Allah, in his excellent 40 hadith goes into some detail concerning this particular point. If anybody would like to go back to it, and it is translated into English. Number four, uh, from this hadith we learn that when the words Islam and Iman are mentioned together, then Islam is explained as al-umur al-zahira, the outward uh, things that we see. And Iman is explained by al-umur al-batina, the inward things that we don't see, yani what we believe in. Point number five, from this hadith we also understand the importance of beginning with that which is more important, yani beginning with al-ham, and then that which is yani also important but less important, and that is because in this hadith, in the explanation of Islam, the Prophet وسلم, began with that which was most important of the arkan of Islam, that is what? Huh? Naam, al shahadatain And he began his explanation of iman, with the most important of the arkan of Iman, and that is Iman Billahi. Point number six, the Shaykh says uh, that the arkan of Islam are five. Unlike what we read in some people who are attributed, who there is attributed to them scholarship, we read in some of the famous books in English, and it's not only in English, that um, yani other than this, the arkan of Islam are five, and the usul of Iman are six. The arkan of Islam are five, and the usul of iman are six. Number seven, that al-iman, and al-iman, bi usul al-iman, as sitta min jumla al-iman bil ghaib. Naam, that having iman in these fundamentals, yani usul of iman, as sitta, the six fundamentals of iman, having iman in these six things is part of iman and al ghaib. Having iman in the unseen, this is part of the many aspects of Iman in the unseen. Number eight, a clarification of um, the uh, superiority uh, of one over the other, that is Islam and Iman and Ihsan. Yani that Iman is superior to Islam and Ihsan is superior to Iman. Number nine, clarification of the high station of the level of Al-Ihsan, its high lofty station. Number ten, that the, now, the knowledge of the hour is from that which Allah has kept for himself. Yani that is not shared with anyone in the creation. Number 11, clarification of something, a little bit 
of the signs of the hour. And finally, and he, the last point the Shaykh says, قول المسؤول لما لا يعلم الله أعلم. يعني that a person who's being asked about something which they didn't know that they should say Allahu A'lam. And this is derived from what? Saying Allahu A'lam in this hadith is derived from what? From the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam saying مَا الْمَسُولُ بِأَعْلَمْ مِنَ السَّعِلِ And he said, and he basically, that literally he said, the one who is being questioned doesn't know any more than the questioner. The meaning of it is what? Allahu A'lam. And we don't, I don't know. And that's what a person should say when they don't know, they should say they don't know and they should not do what we find people doing today. May Allah save us from that. And he just freestyling. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika. Shalun la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk. After the salat, inshallah, uh, we're going to pray now. After the salat, if anybody wants to recite this hadith that we just completed today, then I'm willing to remain behind and listen to you. You can do it publicly or privately as you like. Whatever you feel comfortable with. Barakallahu feekum wa jazakum Allah